Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. Live in the studio with me today, I have Angela Cooley. Angela is a corporate speech trainer and speech language pathologist with 22 years of experience. She holds a Certificate of Clinical Competence awarded by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. At her company, Live Communications, she coaches individuals to improve their professional speaking voice by providing strategies and competencies needed to communicate successfully in the workplace. Angela, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Angela. Well, it's so good to see you. We were just talking that we met about a year ago, I think. Yes, it was about an, a year ago. An event. And so you work with individuals um, on sort of their presentation and any kind of speech issues. Is that right? That, that's correct. That's okay. correct. I work with individuals and or groups who desire to improve their communication skills. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm really hoping to dive into some basic things today that I haven't really covered a lot on the podcast before. So I'm excited about that. Um, the first thing is, you know, whenever we meet someone so often, whether it's we're interviewing or we're networking, mm -hmm. we make a first impression. Right. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Yes, I would love to. Well, it takes about seven to 10 seconds to make a great first impression. And one of the first things that um, people pay attention to is your appearance. So you want to make sure that you look the part, that your clothes are fitting appropriately. It's not too tight, that you're not wearing something that's drawing attention to yourself, especially with your accessories. You want to just be neutral with everything that you're wearing. And then also, you want to be mindful of your facial expressions, your eye contact, your body language, how you stand, how you sit. And um, that's really significant in making a good first impression. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so when we, you know, meet someone initially, we shake hands, we make that eye contact, and then usually we say something. Right. I mean, do you have a recommendation on what we might say when we first meet someone? Well, typically when you're going, especially for an interview, the first person that you meet may be the receptionist. So you say good morning and who you are and what you're there for. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you use a very, very good, a strong speech production. And once again, as you stated, you're looking the individual in the eye, and they will see that and feel that confidence that you're exhibiting. So when you say strong speech production, mm -hmm. so I have no idea what you mean. <laughs> um, what I mean, don't mumble, you okay. know, be clear in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're pronouncing the sounds correctly right. and um, be confident in what you're, what you're going to say. Right, right. Well, so also along these lines, when we first meet someone mm -hmm. or when we have an interview, mm -hmm. you know, for the first time, one of the first questions that's often asked is, tell me about yourself. And, you know, that is often considered your elevator pitch, right, your right. elevator speech. Right. Can you give us a little bit of information from your perspective about the elevator speech? Well, yes. An elevator speech is really a very small, quick, precise, um, persuas persuasive speech that you're giving, that you're sharing more about yourself. Um, salespeople use it to sell their uh, products, goods, or services, but it's if you're going to represent yourself, you just want to tell a little bit more about yourself and how you can be beneficial to the organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, from your perspective, you know, one question I often get with elevator pitches or speeches mm -hmm. is how do I end them? I well, mean, you want to end with asking a question. You can ask a question so that you can gain more information about the person that you're talking to. Now, if it's an elevator speech, if you already have an, a job and you work for an organization, you can use an, or, an elevator speech to talk about the organization's um, products and services to a mm -hmm. potential client. Or you can use it to sell an idea or that you, an idea about a project that you want to initiate for that particular organization. So there are different types of elevator speeches. Yeah, absolutely. And what about, how long should it be? I mean... No more than about 20 to 30 seconds. Okay. Um, you know, oftentimes when I talk to folks and I ask them initially to kind of give me their elevator pitch, mm -hmm. they will start in and say something like, well, I grew up in Oklahoma 
and I've got three brothers, and I have two cats, and they start down this path. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I guess the the feedback I would have as well is that you want to keep it focused on business. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, people are not necessarily asking you when they say, "Tell me about yourself." In an interview, they're right. not necessarily asking about your personal life. Right. So you're going to capitalize on what it is that you do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not so much as about yourself, but your professional skills. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And what about um, how technical should we get with our, our language? I mean, if, you know, as we deliver these kinds of things, maybe we come from a technical background or we work in a specialized field. Well, if you're speaking with someone that's within your industry, it's okay to utilize your technical language at that point. Mm -hmm. But if you're speaking to someone that's outside of your industry, you want to make sure that your conversation is neutral and it's understandable. You don't want to use the same jargon that you would use within the work environment because you will lose the individual. Mm -hmm. And so they possibly would not understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You want to just make sure that you're clear, precise, and just use everyday language so that the um, listener can understand the message that you're trying to convey. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And one example that I recently came across uh, with a client was someone who is, you know, really smart, great person, and is transitioning from the military to back to the civilian world. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about the work that they've been doing, for me, you know, I had no idea what they were saying. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the person who was going to interview them probably also would not. Mm -hmm. And it came across, you know, as they were describing their responsibilities, it really came across in a certain way as intimidating to me Mm -hmm. as the listener because they were using acronyms and a lot of information that I just couldn't latch on to. Right. And so as we worked on it, they began to explain things in more of the format of a story Mm -hmm. using much more simple language. And Mm -hmm. all of a sudden I got it Mm -hmm. and it was interesting and I Mm -hmm. understood what they did. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it's a lot easier when you make a real human connection and you tie in a personal experience. And so then they can really, just as you did, gravitate to whatever the message was. And then you became a part of the story and you understood and it became like a picture to you. So it's really, really important to be able to um, just connect with the individual and make sure that your language is simple, especially if you're speaking with someone that's outside of your industry. Right. And I think really having that awareness is very important. With this person, I ask them, you know, the panel who you will be interviewing with at this civilian company, do they have enough of a background to know about this topic that you're talking about that Mm -hmm. has to do with the military? And the person said, no, actually, they don't. And that was what sort of made the alarms go off for me to say Mm -hmm. we need to rework how we talk about this Mm -hmm. in a way that can connect, you know, with those folks that will be interviewing them. Right. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, in general, when we go in for whether it's an interview or whether it's, you know, we're going to work Mm -hmm. every day, one thing that also comes up in terms of our language and our communication is how formal or how casual Mm -hmm. maybe we should be Mm -hmm. in our language. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some guidelines around that? Yes, I think um, depending upon your work environment, you want to make sure that your language match your will match your work environment. So, if you're in a professional setting, you want to sound professional. If you're working with kids, and you have interactions with kids, sometimes you know you may need to use a more simple language format. But however, still be clear and understandable with those that you're having engagements with. Um, It's not good to utilize slang or jargon, things of that nature, because it's just uh, maybe misinterpreted. But just want to make sure that your language is um, relatable to the people that you're talking to and that match the environment that you're having interactions with. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. You know, I probably fall in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I'm probably overly formal. I've Mm -hmm. had friends tease me that um, I'm not more casual in my personal life Mm -hmm. with my language. But I do think in business, it can be quite helpful uh, to speak in a relatively, you know, formal manner Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. day to day. And what about in terms of our vocabulary? I mean, I know, you know, some people are more um, interested in using sort of big words Mm -hmm. versus... uh, Really common language. I think language. the more natural you are and then the more your language is simple and just understandable 
for everyone. I think your message, once again, is more clear and people have an ability to understand what you're trying to say. Just like when you're reading the newspaper, I think it's written at a fifth or sixth grade level. And so you want to speak so that everyone can understand you. Mm -hmm. But if you're having engagements with your colleagues or business professionals, then you may want to use language that a bit more formal and that they understand. Once again, as we spoke about the jargon and acronyms and things of that nature that will be understandable to them, but try to just utilize your language such that that it's understandable by the general masses. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes too, when you begin to use complex vocabulary, for example, when it's not needed or it's not appropriate, I think it can almost be intimidating Mm -hmm. to the person you're speaking to because Mm -hmm. if they don't know that exact word and they're trying to guess what's going on, Mm -hmm. I mean, it feels like it really creates a barrier. It does, and then it distorts the message, and then there's no clarity. Right, right. Well, so you work with a lot of people who are either looking for a job or who are working their way up. You know, we, we talked at the beginning. I know mm-hmm. you work with people who are delivering presentations and trying to be more effective in their communication. Right. You know, from your perspective as a professional, what are some of the common mistakes that people make with regards to their communication styles? What are, do you work with people on? Well, some of the common mistakes that I've noticed is their speech is too fast or they're mumbling when they're speaking or they may not have really good listening skills. So you want to make sure that you're speaking at a rate that's understandable by your listeners, taking your time, saying your ending sounds, um, pronouncing all of the syllables in the words. If you mumble, once again, it distorts the message so there's no clarity of thought Mm -hmm. and misinformation is miscommunicated and um, impacts the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one thing that kind of occurred to me or I thought about as I was preparing uh, for today was actually a personal example that happened to me. And Mm -hmm. I think it's a really great um, thing to think about as we we talk about this communication issue. So Mm -hmm. for me, um, a few years ago, I was working for a company called First Tennessee Bank. Mm -hmm. And we were launching a product, and I had to speak at a press conference to the media Mm -hmm. for the first time. And I was practicing, and I was getting ready for this event. And every time I would say the word Tennessee, people would think I was saying the word Hennessy with an H. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) it was a problem because Mm -hmm. you can't go in front of the media and say your company's name wrong, Mm -hmm. right? And so I worked with someone who does a similar job that you do, and Mm -hmm. I went to them and said, what is going on with me Mm -hmm. because I've never had this issue. And she said to me, "Um, have you had some dental work done recently? Mm -hmm. That was her first question. I said, well, actually, I had a wire installed on the back of my teeth Mm -hmm. that is like a permanent retainer. Mm -hmm. And we went through these sounds, and there were certain sounds that I could no longer say in the same way. Mm -hmm. And we had to practice those sounds Mm -hmm. to get me ready Mm -hmm. to speak to the media. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find, do you ever have clients that come to you with issues like that? Yes, with pronunciation errors or inability to say certain sounds, yes. And so we just practice on those drills, uh, identify what those sounds are, and just do a lot of speech drills to help them to correctly produce them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if someone feels like, I mean, how do they end up coming to you? Or is it that someone, they're having trouble, no one can understand them? What? Well, how do they- actually, referrals, most of the clients I've received thus far is based upon referrals. They know someone that received the services and um, had received good benefits from them. And so they refer me to the next client. And yeah. so we just begin to talk about what those concerns are that they have individually. So I had one guy in particular worked for an insurance company that had difficulties with certain words that he would say on a day to basis that's directly related to his insurance industry. Yeah. And um, so what I asked him to do was bring me a list of words that you talk that you talk about every day. And so we went through those words and identified those specific sounds mm-hmm. that he had difficulties with and we began to practice. So I would show him placement, how to where to put his tongue, where to put his teeth, and um, voicing, things of that nature, just to help him to be able to produce it more correctly. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. What about how loud people speak? You know, does that influence things? Yes, it does, because if you you speak too loud, (laughs) if you're really speaking like 
really, really loud. It can be distort, uh, distort your message and maybe annoying to the people that you're talking to. But what I find it's a lot of times people do not speak loud enough. So in your how you stand and how you sit, allowing yourself to have the appropriate um, voicing and your diaphragm to generate the correct air from your diaphragm so that you can produce the sounds and the words that you need to say clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's interesting. It reminds me of, um, you know, when you were a kid in elementary school and you had to take like you had to sing in music class and they would always make you sit. Yes. Really straight. Mm -hmm. So that kind of leads into the next question I wanted to ask you about, Mm -hmm. which is nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. And you, you touched on it in the beginning, but what exactly is nonverbal communication? Why is it important? Well, nonverbal communication would consist of your tone of speech, your inflection, your rate of speech, um, facial expressions, body gestures, all of that is con- it's considered to be nonverbal communication. Only 10% of the words that we say constitute the message that we're trying to convey. And so the remaining 90% is reliant upon your nonverbal communication skills. So it's really important to utilize your nonverbal communication skills so that your message can be clear and understandable by your listener. Right. You know, I actually interviewed a body language expert recently for the Mm -hmm. podcast, and his feedback was that when your verbal communication and your nonverbal communication don't match. Oh, it distorts the message once again. Right. His feedback was that people believe your nonverbal communication before they believe your verbal communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That if... If you look unhappy, if you're slumped over, but mm-hmm. you sound okay, mm-hmm. people pay more attention to the slumped over thing right, than to right, what you sound right. like. Do I totally agree. That? Okay. Totally agree. And how much, so what about, and this is an issue I find with some clients, what about smiling, for mm-hmm. example? Smiling is so important because it conveys confidence mm-hmm. in your speech production. And when you smile, you sound more relaxed. You sound like you really uh, know what you're talking about and you're really engaging with the listeners. So smiling is really significant as well as eye contact because you want to let them know that you're interested in them and you want to know how they are receiving the message that you're sharing as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, occasionally I will well, more than occasionally, I will talk to job seekers who, you know, they're pretty nervous mm-hmm. when they go on an interview, and this mm-hmm. is a big deal. And so they're thinking so hard about getting their answer just right, making mm-hmm. it sound just right, that they forget to smile. Mm-hmm. And it makes them either look intimidating or it makes them look really serious or mm-hmm. it makes them look uninterested, mm-hmm. something negative. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's interesting that you say, you know, it is really important. Yes, it is. It is. I often talk to people about the fact that I think of when you go to like a comedy show, mm-hmm. you know, you go and listen to a performer tell jokes. Mm-hmm. And when you leave, you don't always remember exactly what the jokes were, but you remember if you laughed and you remember how you felt. Mm-hmm. And I think oftentimes when we meet new people, it sticks with us how we feel about mm-hmm. them more mm-hmm. than exactly what they said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if if you have that experience. (laughs) I agree with you. I think that you do remember what the experience was. You remember if they were really exciting to talk to, if they were relatable. So all of that is really important. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious not to get off track, but how did you, you've been doing this for 22 years. How Mm -hmm. did you kind of get involved in this field? Well, it all started when I was a little girl. My brother Michael was a chronic stutterer. Oh, really? And okay. every morning um, I would watch my brother cry because the kids were so mean to him in school. And he was afraid to communicate in the school at school. And so every morning he would go to my mom and my dad and he would say that he did not want to go to school. And so it was so bad. And so sometimes Michael would. Um, chew on his fingers and he would have little nodules on his fingers and so my mother said it was then that she knew that she needed to do something and so he she sought out a speech coach a speech therapist and um in the school system and that didn't work so well so then he went to a medical setting and I would go with him to the speech sessions oh, wow. and so she said whatever the speech therapist told Michael to do I would then say as a little girl okay you need to do this so I began to pretend that I was her to him at home no at the session okay. I would be I came into the session with him so okay. and it was then that 
I began to see his life change. He began to utilize the techniques and um, try to improve his communication skills, which he did. And over the years through elementary, junior high, he just began to gain his confidence um, after he receive those services. And so it was then that it, that I determined that I too wanted to help people to be able to speak confidently, to be able to um, find their own communication voice and to do it with ease and with poise. Wow, that's mm-hmm. such a good story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's so cool. And so it's probably been something, has it stuck with him forever? Yes. Well, and but now um, Michael is able to, he's he's fine with this communication. You know, sometimes he may have some moments where he stutters, right. but um, he knows the techniques that he use, he needs to implement to make sure that he's clear and fluent and productive. That's so cool. So mm-hmm. did you, when, when you did come home from the sessions, did you ever work with him afterward or was it no you just, okay, no no it just no sessions. just end of the sessions and remember i was a little girl right <laughs> <laughs> oh that's fun well so speaking of you know doing presentation or presenting yourself mm-hmm. in a way you know i occasionally work with job seekers i actually worked with someone yesterday mm-hmm. who was going in for a pretty big interview mm-hmm. and was asked kind of at the last minute to put together a 15 minute presentation mm-hmm. um for the interview and Mm -hmm. i've seen this actually with other companies as well like they there's a company called glassdoor.com it's Mm -hmm. a website they list a lot of jobs for job seekers Mm -hmm. well when they hire people to come and work at glassdoor Mm -hmm. at their company one of the things i've seen in their online reviews is that they almost always will ask you to put together a presentation about yourself Mm -hmm. and you have to present it at some point during the interview process. So for those of us who may get this question and we've never had it before, Mm -hmm. what tips would you have on putting together a quick presentation for an interview? Well, first I would say you would need to know the audience, who's gonna be on the panel. Mm -hmm. And once you identify that, you wanna research the organization, you wanna research the industry, as well as you wanna research the competition. Mm -hmm. So once you do that, you would know how to develop your presentation. Mm -hmm. And when I think of a presentation, I think of a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. And so with your introduction, you want to say something that's very captivating, that you're not looking at your notes and that will grab the attention of the audience members. And in the beginning of your presentation, you want to tell them what you're going to tell them. In the middle, you will tell them. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you will tell them what you told them. Mm -hmm. So, and then you also want to have a memorable ending. So if you're gathering information and you're going to include some things about yourself, those are some really quick tips that would be very helpful. And lastly, you would ask the panelists if they have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about, so different people have different philosophies on this. I don't know that there's a right answer, but if you go in and you have slides that you're presenting like a Mm -hmm. PowerPoint, Mm -hmm. some people, their style is they want to read from the PowerPoint, like they want to read the whole thing. No, you shouldn't read the PowerPoint and don't allow the PowerPoint to give the delivery. You give the delivery. And so make sure that you're engaging the audience, utilizing your eye contact, your facial expressions, all of that, your body language, all of that will help to tell the story for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And it's good to utilize pictures within your PowerPoint so that you uh, trigger keywords within yourself so that you will be able to spontaneously share the information that you're trying to convey. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's I totally agree. Well, what about, so oftentimes when it comes to interviewing in general, mm-hmm. we get up in the morning and we sort of have a routine where we're putting on our suit and we're, you know, getting ready to go in for this interview that makes us kind of nervous. Mm-hmm. In terms of what we could do to have sort of the best speaking voice possible, Mm -hmm. is there anything Mm -hmm. we should or shouldn't be doing either the night before or the day of? Yeah, we want to make sure that you get a really good good night's rest. And when you wake up in the morning, you can do some um, speech um, riddles. Mm -hmm. And just to warm your voice up, you can sing or do the musical scale, say the musical scale. And um, also... You can stretch, you know, just to get in a relaxed posture. Like your whole yes, body? yes. Okay. Stretch your entire body, and breathing, breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Some breathing exercises just to get your body in tune with what you're going to do for the day and just relax. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you say speech riddle, I have a guess what you mean, but could you could you tell me just to be sure? Yeah. Um, 
one, like say for instance, peanut butter and jelly. You can repeat that over and over and over again. There are other speech riddles. Do you do you remember any of your childhood riddles? Well, so the one that I've heard with regards to speaking is unique New York. That's one. Yes. And if you say that over and over, it forces you to really enunciate, I right. think. Right. That's correct. And you really pay attention to the sounds that you're saying. And the faster you say them, there's a likelihood that you may make a mistake. Right. But if you do, it's okay. Just start over. But the purpose of the riddles is for you to really focus in on what your lips, your teeth, and your tongue is doing, as well as your breathing. Mm -hmm. So it helps you to be more conscious of your speech production. Right. And Mm -hmm. what about, is there anything that we can drink that will help us? Is it you just stay hydrated? or Yeah, make sure you drink um, water Mm -hmm. and um, also maybe something warm, Mm -hmm. you know, but you want to make sure that you have a like I stated earlier, a good night's rest. Get up in the morning. Give yourself something to eat. Don't overeat. Make sure that you're not overly full, okay. but just satisfy. You know, satisfy your hunger. Um, have something to s- soothe your um, throat. If it's cold, you know, you may want to drink something that's warm to soothe your throat. But that should prepare you so that your voice is really strong and clear when you're speaking to the interviewer. Right, right. Mm-hmm. I agree. And for me, I know if I'm having a day where my voice, I'm not quite sure about it, I will sometimes put like a cough drop in my pocket or whatever mm-hmm. so that, you know, not that I want that in my mouth as I'm speaking to mm-hmm. other people, but if I feel like I may cough or something, it's it feels good leading up to mm-hmm. the point of the interview to kind of keep that to a minimum. Right. But, it will help you to, to, de- to decrease the coughing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And mm-hmm. I know... Like with and, the weather we've been having. Yeah, and sometimes <laughs> when we have, sometimes doing an interview, you may find that you get dry mouth. Mm-hmm. And something that I've shared with my clients is to bite the tip of your tongue gently. And then once you do so, you'll feel the saliva in your mouth secreting, and then you, that will help to re moisten your mouth. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's a good tip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Well, we have really covered a lot of different topics, and I mean, I really appreciate it. Is there anything else, you know, that you would like to share with us today to leave with us with regards to interviewing? Or, I mean, have we pretty well covered it? I think we pretty well covered everything, yes. (laughs) That's good. Well, if there's anybody who would like to reach out to you, do you only work with clients locally, or do you also work over Skype? Or Yes, we do provide services over Skype. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. And how can someone get in touch with you or learn more about you? Do you have a website? Yes, my website is www.thelifecommunications.com. Okay, Mm -hmm. that's great. So thelifecommunications.com. And Mm -hmm. are you on social media at all? Yes, I am on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And what is your Twitter handle? Um, My Twitter handle is the life communications. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been great. Angela, thank you so much. Uh Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. Tune in next week for another edition of the Copeland Coaching Podcast. And if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher so you never miss an episode. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.